as a Kuchana Kuchana. Welcome aboard. Then race over to the Moss Eisley Cantina for cocktails with the galaxy's most outrageous characters. If adventure is your middle name, this is the tour for you. Galactic regulations require that all carry-on items be safely stowed beneath your seat. We droids are made to suffer such indignities. Flash photography is not permitted. And please, no smoking at any time. W Radio, your information station. Hello and welcome to the WDW Radio Show your Walt Disney World information station. Thanks for tuning in once again. I'm Lou Mangello, coming to you this and every week, bringing you the very best ways to enjoy and enhance your Walt Disney World vacation. This is show number 68 for the week of May 25th, 2008. News from Walt Disney World includes some Prince Caspian sightings, a new restaurant opening at one of the Disney resorts, as well as a new addition to another restaurant and changes coming to the wide world of sports. In the Walt Disney World rumor mill, I'll have an update to the Space Mountain rumor, a sponsor that may be moving out and no longer living with the land, and a few hints of some other new rumors as well. With Star Wars weekends rapidly approaching, and some rumors about this attraction resurfacing once again, there is no better time for Jeff and I to don our Jedi robes and do a DSI, Disney Scene Investigation of Star Tours at Disney's Hollywood Studios. We'll explore the history of the attraction, the story behind it, an exceptionally geeky look at the queue, the shop, and what the future may hold. You don't need to be a Star Wars fan to enjoy the attraction or this segment, but it might just make them a little bit more fun. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to meet and chat with T.C. Newman. She's one of the two Walt Disney World ambassadors about her role, what a day in her life is like, her duties and responsibilities, and so much more. It's a look at one of the most highly coveted roles in the grand Walt Disney World cast. I'll answer some more of your emails, play some voicemails, and tell you about some changes to the website, as well as a few new free downloads you might enjoy. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. It's been a couple of weeks since we had any Walt Disney World news in the show. I apologize for that. But before we get into this week's news, I want to start off by telling you something a little bit about the show. And it comes to us thanks to a listener. Many times when I do segments on the show, especially things like the Disney scene investigations with Jeff, I'm asking you to use your mind's eye to visualize what we're talking about. And sometimes it's not so easy, especially when we're talking about some of those little hidden details. And part of the point is that I want you to go to Walt Disney World to seek out these things for yourself, explore the queue, the shop, the attractions, and even just the different lands of the parks and other areas of the resort. But you can't always get there as often as you want. And listener Paul Bousquet did something that I think you're really going to enjoy. He started taking a few of the Disney scene investigation segments and turning them into enhanced podcast formats. Now, what does that mean? Well, an enhanced podcast is a format that allows photos to be inserted into the audio feed so that you can see some of what we're talking about. All you need to do is download the file and play it in either iTunes or better yet, download it to your iPod and take it with you to the parks. You can download these files for free. They are in the DisneyWorldTrivia.com download section. You can find the link in our show notes this week. They're not available on the iTunes store. They are available only for the site, but like I said, it's free. All you need to do is register, and once you download them, All you have to do is just double-click on the file, and it'll play in iTunes. And again, you could also put this right on your iPod. The first two that he's done are the Jungle Cruise queue and our DSI of the Echo Lake area in Disney's Hollywood Studios. I think you're really going to enjoy the additional visual element to that, and big thanks to Paul for his work on these. Again, these are available for free by visiting DisneyWorldTrivia.com, and in the navigation bar on the top, just clicking on the Download section look in the WDW Radio Show section of that area. Also, speaking of the websites, I wanted to let you know that this morning I launched an all-new WDWRadio.com website. It has a new look, easier updates, it's easier to search, and I want to be able to put in some more multimedia content. You'll also be able to follow my instant updates on Twitter and more. 
If you have been to the DisneyWorldTrivia.com site, you'll see that the look is pretty consistent, so you're going to find it's probably a little bit easier to navigate, and like I said, there'll be more features coming to the site soon. Everything that you found on the old site has been transferred over. Again, our show notes page, everything else can be found at WDWRadio.com. Now, on to this week's Walt Disney World news. According to USA Today, as early as this Tuesday, you're going to be able to experience Walt Disney World in 3D right from your computer and anywhere in the world. As Disney has partnered with Google Earth to map all four parks, all 22 Disney hotels and resorts, including 1,500 attractions, restaurants, and more. Disney's Jay Rizzullo said the map is going to serve as a cutting-edge trip planner, and it's one small step away from actually being there. Now, the map was created by eight photographers who canvassed every inch of Walt Disney World for more than 10 days, then their images were converted and rendered in 3D. Now, the cool thing about this map is that it's going to be interactive. So you can click on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, for example, and you can view a video of the ride and get information such as height requirements, etc. You can point your mouse on a resort like the Polynesian. You'll not only get a video of the resort, But the most intriguing part to me is that you can also check availability and rates as well as make a reservation. Now, for for now, the maps are only going to show exteriors, and in the future, visitors should be able to go through attractions or buildings like Cinderella Castle and explore the rooms at each of the Disney resorts. Photographers are also at work mapping Disneyland Resort Paris and other Disney Resort properties around the world. Now, this map with all these interactive features is going to be available at DisneyWorld.com slash 3D Parks or by going to Google Earth. That's Earth.Google.com. You can also download it there. I'll put links to both of those in this week's show notes. Inside the parks, a Prince Caspian character meet and greet location has opened at Disney's Hollywood Studios right between the currently closed Narnia attraction and Toy Story Midway Mania. The new Prince Caspian attraction is going to replace the original Narnia walkthrough exhibit and it's going to test guest knowledge of the stories. Then they're going to get a chance to see a film with narration by the motion pictures director, Andrew Adamson, and then let guests experience some of the Narnia sets and props. The attraction is going to open later on this summer, but the meet and greet, like I said, is open now. It's located between Soundstage 4, between One Man's Dream and Toy Story Mania. Speaking of Toy Story Mania and Pixar Studios, there have been some subtle changes to the area as well. Soundstage 1, which was the former home of the Sorcerer Mickey meet and greet, now has a new marquee that reads, Soundstage 1, hot set, we are preparing for a new production. Now, while I was there a couple of weeks ago, I did see some workers coming out of the building during my visit, but the windows are still blacked out, leaving us all to wonder just what's coming next. And Toy Story Mania is in full swing, as soft previews are now happening almost daily, merchandise is available, and the Pixar Place walkway is open between the Animation Courtyard and the Backlot Tour. Also, Toy Story Mania has begun showing up on all new park maps. Now, as I said last week, you have to be sure to see this attraction as it's something really, really special. And on those maps, although the signage says Pixar Studios, the maps do say Pixar Place. Now, that's the official name for this new section of the park. Neither the new dining location nor the Toy Story Mania gift shop have opened as yet, although merchandise is available in other areas of the parks, including the Sorcerer Mickey hat. And while you can walk down Pixar Place, there are still construction walls that are open in front of the area where the cafe and the store will be opposite the attraction's entrance. Now, it's going to be very interesting to see, just as a quick aside, how this attraction's opening may affect crowds during the very, very busy Star Wars weekends that are going to take place all throughout June. And speaking of Star Wars weekends, I got an email this week from Disney Dame, who sent me a link to a website saying that visitors at Disney's Hollywood Studios recently came across a few new items over at Tatooine Traders. There are new pins, one of the Empire symbol with Mickey Mouse ears, and another of a Stormtrooper is eating a Mickey ice cream bar. There's also new t-shirts, one with that same Stormtrooper design, and lots of other merchandise that's come out even before Star Wars weekends officially begins. One other notable item, and I'm sure the jokes will begin about this one, features Minnie Mouse dressed like Princess Leia, Mickey dressed like a stormtrooper, and Leia uttering the famous line, aren't you a little short to be a stormtrooper? Yes, I'll be sure to pick that shirt up. That runs about $25. There was also some new watches there with Mickey as Anakin and Donald as Darth Maul. Those run $90 each. 
Now, this is just the tip of the iceberg of the type of merchandise that's going to be coming out for Star Wars weekends. I will be down there for the first weekend to cover it. I'll also try and report on some of the merchandise that is available, including shirts, hats, pins, and the very, very eagerly anticipated Star Wars and Disney character Big Figs. Over at the resort, demolition of the Treehouse Villas has begun and can actually be seen by guests who are traveling on Disney Vacation Club Way or golfing on the nearby golf course. Now, Disney has not released any official information as yet as to exactly how these new treehouses will be used by guests in the future. Over at Disney's Contemporary Resort, The Wave, the new upscale restaurant and lounge located on the first floor of the resort, has opened advanced dining reservations for June 7, 2008 for dinner seating only and beyond. Now, it's expected to possibly open earlier than that date and take seatings on a walk-up basis only. Over at the Polynesian Resort Hotel, the Kona Cafe has begun serving a limited sushi menu for dinner beginning on May 25th as part of a new trial program. Now, it's not clear if this is a permanent addition to the menu or how long this trial run may last, but I did call and speak to someone earlier this morning at the Kona Cafe just to confirm that we do, in fact, have another location on property in a resort hotel to get sushi. In other news around the resort, Walt Disney World and ESPN are joining forces to rebrand Disney's wide world of sports with the ESPN logo, creating an entertaining and immersive experience for the nearly 2 million athletes, coaches, and spectators who come through the sports complex each year. Now, plans for the rebranding are still in the development stage, but initial concepts do include renaming the complex, incorporating signature elements of ESPN throughout the 220-acre facility, enhancing the experience of both athletes and spectators by connecting them to their favorite ESPN shows, personality, and other elements, and also providing advertisers new sponsorship opportunities. The rebranding of the resort is the latest in the growing sports business at Walt Disney World because back in December, Wide World of Sports debuted another outdoor playing field for football, soccer, lacrosse, and field hockey. And this summer, the sports complex is going to open the Jostin Center, which is going to be a new state-of-the-art field house that's going to allow Disney to accommodate twice as many indoor sports events each year, and additional expansion plans are being explored. Now, if you've never been to Disney's Wide World of Sports, or if you're just wondering what kind of things go on there, each year they host more than 180 events in more than 50 different sports, including professional sports such as the Atlanta Braves Spring Training, Tampa Bay Rays host some regular season baseball game there, the Major League Baseball Draft is held there, the NBA Pre-Draft Camp is there, The NFL's Tampa Bay Buccaneers hold training camp there, Pop Warner Super Bowl. Lots of things that go on there for professional and amateur athletes as well. Also, it is the host for the Walt Disney World Marathon, which is obviously one of the top marathons in the nation. For more information, you can head on over to DisneyWorldSports.Disney.Go. To celebrate the new and now formally named American Idol Experience attraction that's coming to Disney's Hollywood Studios in January 2009, David Cook shouted those famous words, I'm going to Disney World, this past May 21st, after being crowned the newest American Idol. The commercial aired just hours after the American Idol finale, and it's the first time that a singer, as opposed to a professional sports athlete, uttered those words after, say, they win a Super Bowl or some other professional championship. Now, um, the American Idol experience is currently under construction over at Disney's Hollywood Studios. It's the first attraction anywhere in the world based on the popular television show, And when it's finished, like I said, when it opens in January 2009, guests are going to be able to experience that whole interactive element by being able to audition and then perform in front of a live audience. If you want to see the American Idol commercial with the I'm Going to Disney World, I put a video up of it in my blog on DisneyWorldTrivia.com. And here's a quick did you know. Do you know who the very first athlete was to ever utter those words as part of a campaign commercial? It was Phil Simms of my New York Giants after the Giants won the 1986 Super Bowl. For more news as it's released, you can head on over to the news and articles section of DisneyWorldTrivia.com. And while you're there, be sure to visit the forums if you want to talk about or comment on anything covered in this week's show. Over in the Walt Disney World rumor mill, let's start off in the Magic Kingdom as the Space Mountain refurb rumor is back once again. And latest rumors indicate that Space Mountain will in fact get a major refurbishment, including overhaul and possible replacement of some of or all of the track, although the the layout is going to remain the same. The track layout is not going to change. 
There's going to be a new load area, new on-ride effects, a darkened on-ride environment, and new trains that are going to include new single-passenger seating and an all-new audio system. Now, here's the bad news. The refurbishment is rumored to begin in January 2009 and last anywhere from 10 to 11 months. So it's possible that for pretty much all of 2009, Space Mountain might be down, although based on some of the rumors I'm hearing, it might just be worth the wait once it opens up again. Also in the Magic Kingdom over in Frontierland, the Diamond Horseshoe Saloon will allegedly open for lunch on select days beginning in the next couple of days. It's once again going to offer a lunch serving of sandwiches and snacks beginning today, May 25th, as well as on the 27th and 30th of this month from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now, I'm unsure if this is going to continue throughout the summer to help with in-park crowds, but we will find out once we get into the June and summer months. Over in Epcot, I'm being told that all references to Nestle as the sponsor of the Land Pavilion have recently been removed. Now, this, coupled with the recent closure of the Junior Chef program, appear to confirm a rumor that I mentioned a few months ago that Nestle has, in fact, ceased their sponsorship of the Pavilion, although no formal confirmation from either Disney or Nestle has been released as yet. A number of listeners who recently came back from Walt Disney World have let me know that the Fuel for Thought post-show exhibit over at Test Track in Future World has closed for seemingly unscheduled refurbishment and or possible replacement. Now, it's unclear whether it's going to reopen as a new Fuel for Thought or as a new exhibit altogether. Over at the studios, I have some rumors about Star Tours, which I'm going to cover in the Star Wars DSi segment on this week's show. But over at the resorts, it looks like the new C-shaped tower that's being built next to Disney's Contemporary Resort, which was originally referred to as the Kingdom Tower, may be getting a new name even before it opens, as it appears as though it's being referred to as the Bay Lake Tower at Disney's Contemporary Resort in some construction permits that were recently filed. Now, speaking of construction, the bridge between the current tower and the new building is almost complete, and it's going to link the fifth floor of the Bay Lake Tower with the fourth floor of the Contemporary's A-Frame Tower. Now, why the different floors? It's likely due to the Contemporary's Grand Canyon Concourse and the lower-level ballrooms taking up additional height. But one thing that, we, that has come to light is that access to the bridge will be controlled by key card locks. So guests who are not staying at the resort looks like they cannot get off the monorail, go across the Grand Canyon concourse and make their way into the new building. Now, Disney has not yet formally announced what the name of the building will be or whether it will be for resort guests or a DVC property, although I'm betting on the latter. Uh, well, obviously, I have to stay tuned for more official releases from Disney once they're released. And a couple of other little rumors that I've heard that I just want to kind of drop some hints about is that I have heard that Disney is looking to include plans to bring Oswald merchandise into the art of Disney stores around property. And I'll just tease you with the possibility of an all-new dining location coming to the parks, as well as a new party that's going to be included as part of your admission coming to one of the parks as well. If you have a rumor that you've heard or a comment that you want to make or something you want to share, you can email me at lou at wdwradio.com or call the voicemail and get on the air at 206 206- 202-4-WDW. That's 206-202-4939. Okay, I love Walt Disney World, and there's no surprise there. And if you've listened to the show before... You know that it's for so many reasons, above and beyond just enjoying the rides and the shows and, of course, the food. But let's be honest, our love from Walt Disney World really stems from some of those attractions that maybe we grew up on or made incredible memories with our family or friends while riding, or just those that make you feel happy or thrilled or relaxed or whatever it may be. And I am certainly no different, as there are a number of attractions that I simply love for one reason or another. But this week... This week, I'm really going to have some fun, and I've really been looking forward to this for a long, long time, because I not only get to do one of my favorite types of segments, and that's a Disney scene investigation with Jeff Pepper, where we explore and hopefully introduce you to some of those little details and trivia and history and overlooked facts, but this time, I can really get my geek on, and I get to combine two of my loves and things that kept me quite occupied in my younger years, and that's Walt Disney World and Star Wars. 
So yes, Jeff and I are going to don our Jedi robes and arm ourselves with our magnifying glasses and lightsabers as we take a very close look at Star Tours at Disney's Hollywood Studios. So once again, I bring in my young Padawan learner who knows that doing a DSI isn't like dusting crops, boy. And that's Jeff Pepper. I think we got to work on who's the Padawan here. <laughs> you know, there can only be two. Uh, <laughs> God, I'm really sorry. It's only, it's only going to get worse, folks. I it's promise you. It's going to get worse you. from here on out. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, the, the geek level is really going to uh, probably get blown out of the water. Um, because we're doing this, obviously, Jeff, in anticipation of Star Wars weekends, which are going to be running over at Disney's Hollywood Studios through June. I'm going to be there the first weekend, and I'm really, really looking forward to it. I've been a Star Wars fan since 77, and I can say with... Some pride and some reservation that I've seen the original films way more than 100 times each, uh, probably close for, uh, for Empire and Jedi. Second trilogy, not so much, but I'm getting there. And Jeff, I, I know you, you're you a child of the same generation, so you're probably a Star yeah, Wars I, fan. I walked into that theater when I was 16 years old in 1977, and that was the end of it. I, like you, I am a self-professed Star Wars uber geek, and, in, and in when George Lucas kind of... Uh, jumped into the Disney family per se with with uh, attractions and then ultimately Star Tours in the late uh, 80s it was just it was a marriage made in heaven and it was just it was a penultimate moment for those of us who who were both Star Wars and Disney fans and as will be evidenced by the crowds that are going to come to Star Wars weekends you and I are not alone in our love of the marriage of Star Wars um, and Disney and what the relationship to it has evolved so interestingly and so synergistically if that's a word correct word to use but now as many of us know there is just this incredible togetherness of the two where we have the merchandise we have the characters the 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 the, the disney canon of characters mickey donald goofy portrayed in star wars forms with you know collectibles with the big figs things like that so it has reached this this kind of amazing kind of penultimate kind of situation that is just so wonderful for folks like us <laughs> Absolutely, and even with Star Tours, when it when it first was being developed, it's that, like you said, that marriage of the imagination and the technical wizardry of Lucas and his team over at ILM, which is Industrial Light and Magic, and the creativity of the Imagineers. You want to talk about bringing the two major creative forces together. That's why they've done so, so many successful things like Star Tours and even Indiana Jones and the Epic Stunt Spectacular. And, and an interesting thing to note, and I think you'll remember as well, Lou, is in the late 70s, you know, as we came off of Star Wars and we were heading into The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, one of the comments you frequently heard at the time was because at that point in time, Disney, you know, the Disney studio was kind of languishing in kind of a, a the doldrums. A, it, you know, it had a very bad kind of track record for its movies and such like that. And one of the things you often heard repeated was, you know, Star Wars was the kind of movie that Disney should have made, or you know, Indiana Jones was the kind of movie that the Disney studio should have made. And you know, and it, and when kind of you know when Eisner came in in the '80s and kind of you know the company had a big kind of rebirth in a lot of ways. You know, in ter- especially in terms of Hollywood. You know, that's where it, it kind of almost came together in that regard. Exactly, and that, we can kind of start talking about maybe the history of the attraction. And when we do, we're really going to be talking about the history of the attraction as it pertains to Disneyland, because it went there as well. But it's important to note for the version of Disney's Hollywood Studios, which really is for most, uh, for all intents and purposes, a mirror image of what we have in Disneyland. And like you said, what was going on there in the early 80s was Disney looking to kind of get to that next generation of of thrill ride or next generation of a, of a guest experience. And they wanted to use a technology that they were developing or looking into which was that of a flight simulator that was used by military and airline for pilot training and marry it to a Disney franchise. And the hope was that they wanted to use it for a possible black hole attraction. Now, that was the 1979 film that, while many say was a flop, geeks like me, I actually enjoyed. I loved Vincent and I, and I loved the whole thing. But for Disney's purposes, it wasn't enough to bring an attraction to the parks. And and if you read some of the early stuff about the Black Hole attraction, Jeff, they actually wanted guests to be able to choose their own ride route. Um, and unfortunately, that got shelved somewhat akin to the Horizons thing, but you would actually choose, like people have 
wished we'd get in Star Tours, choose what your destination would be. Yeah, the irony is that there's an interesting irony with the background to the black hole in that a lot of people felt that black hole was Disney to try to trying to trade on the popularity of Star Wars. And to an extent it was, but the, the actual ideas for the black hole were in development well before Star Wars ever came out. And so it's, it's an interesting bit of irony that, you know, it, it evolved that then went into production ultimately because of the success of Star Wars. And then Star Wars ultimately <laughs> was part of the reason it was likely 86th for the theme park. But it actually ended up working out well because in the early to mid 80s, probably around uh, 84, Frank Wells and Marty Sklar get together and meet up with George Lucas about doing a project together for the parks. Now, Lucas actually knew Michael Eisner, who obviously was working uh, with, with Frank Wells, from Raiders of the Lost Ark days when Eisner was head of Paramount. And Lucas had actually told Disney that if he was going to do something like this, if he was going to do some sort of an attraction based on his movie, the only people he would do it with would be Disney. Um, and that's sort of how the project really got going. Disney had this new technology. Lucas had the franchise. And again, you talked about that marriage. It was just perfect. Yeah, and, and an interesting thing is is George Lucas and, and Steven Spielberg both were very much children of Disney. They, they very much loved Disney growing up. Disney played big, big influences in what how they developed their, their filmmaking and such. I mean, even... You know, one of the things about Close Encounters is it has, you know, the one you wish upon a star music kind of backdrop to it. So these are guys that were very passionate about Disney. And a lot of people, I don't think, really realize that as much. Exactly. And, you know, we mentioned Indiana Jones. We mentioned Star Tours. They also worked together closely on an attraction that had opened before any of these. And that was Captain EO. And that was maybe almost sort of the, the test run of the marriage. And that, and that show was very, very successful and extremely popular when it first opened. And that was, yeah, that's pretty much how George Lucas got his foot in the door into Tomorrowland and Disneyland, per se. Exactly. And and like we said, the attraction was really, the, the, the idea for the attraction was to bring something into the Tomorrowland of Disneyland. They wanted to swap out Adventures Through Inner Space, which had been open since the mid-60s, somewhere around 67. It was time to get that out and bring something fresh in, kind of have to shoehorn an attraction based on these simulators that Disney wanted to go out and buy into that area. And that's what they did. Disney went out, they bought four of these military simulators at about $500,000 each, while ILM worked on the first-person perspective aspect of the film, doing the shooting. Um, and then when they got them together, they brought the film in, got with the simulators. It was actually programmed, and imagine actually sat in the seats and programmed it using a joystick in order to program all the movements. And that was supposed to open in 1986, but as many of these high-tech projects go, it ended up opening up a little bit later than that. And do you know what day that opened up on? As a matter of fact, I do, but please, take it away. Well, I think we need to really discuss the extraordinary significance of this date that it opened, and that was on January 9th, 1987. Not only is that Richard Nixon and Joan Baez's birthday, but that is mine as well. <laughs> so it really has no significance to Disney or Star Wars. <laughs> now, 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 the downside of it is January 9th is also the day that Horizons close, but let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> that really is the most important date, I think, for most of, most of us. But <laughs> the other thing, too, Jeff, was before it went in, the attraction went through a number of changes on the drawing board. Originally... Both Disney and ILM wanted the attraction to be somewhere around 15, 20 minutes. Um, and believe it or not, it was actually shrunk down from that time to almost about four minutes. Um, ILM did all the construction of the props and the sets for shooting of the video. And Imagineering built all the ride vehicles, audio animatronics, and scenes for the queue. It was shot in 70 millimeters. Um, and if you look, you can't really see it, but the projector is located right behind that cockpit barrier. It cost more than $33 million to create, and that's just for the Disneyland version, and that's more than twice the amount that it cost to actually open all of Disneyland in 1955. The only other thing that was significant about the January date was that they were able to meet their deadline of opening the attraction before Star Wars' 10th anniversary in May, and so it was critical that it be opened at that time. But the other thing that I remember, Jeff, about the opening of the attraction was a TV special that obviously aired nationwide about the opening of the attraction in Disneyland, and it was called A Vacation in Space, and it was hosted by Gil uh, Gerard. He played Buck Rogers on the TV show, and Ernie Reyes Jr., who was a young martial artist. He was in uh, movies like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, 
Michael Eisner was in it. Uh, I remember C-3PO and R2-D2 actually doing a rap song, and unfortunately I don't have audio, or fortunately I don't have audio of that, but I do have some photos of screenshots of it that I'll put up in this week's show notes. Yeah, and that, that was what was disappointing, really disappointing as well, is that it was all West Coast, and and like like you and I, we were East Coast based. We were Disney World kind of centric, and 87 was actually the first year I got to go back to Disney World as an adult without parents after I'd gotten married, and we were hearing about this, seeing it all, and it was like, darn it, <laughs> you know, it's way out there. Yeah, I, I remember being disappointed, but fortunately, we didn't, as Disney Walt Disney World fans, didn't have to wait very long because our quote unquote version opened on December 15th, 1989, which is just a couple of months after um, the park opened. It was actually five months after Tokyo's version was ready, and that was in July, and Paris actually got theirs in April. So we were really kind of the last one of the first few parks uh, to get it. And I and I actually did. I managed to, though, get out to see it. I, I saw it at Disneyland first um, in 1989, in summer of 1989. And then what was very, very exciting was is that I went with a friend of mine for a quick weekend trip at Christmas time in that December. And it was very early in December, and we managed to get into a soft opening of it at, at the studios. So that was very exciting. Exciting as a Disney fan and as a Star Wars fan, I assume. It it was great because, as, as you remember, the way the studios was set up um, at the time, that area was blocked off during that the construction phase when, when, you know, when the studios opened in May of 89. Um, that kind of area there was blocked off. So you really, it was really pretty hard to get an idea what they were doing over there. And I just remember that my friends and I that were there, I had gone with two friends and we were all disappointed because I think we were kind of here in the scuttlebutt that it wasn't going to open till January. And so when we came down, we weren't anticipating getting to do it. And I remember we rounded that bend there <laughs> and saw the ad at, and it was like, Oh wow. And then we're like, I think people are walking in <laughs> and, and it was like, people are walking in <laughs> And it was it was just it was a blast. It was just it was really exciting. But one of the things I wanted to mention, Lou, that um, that was really significant for me, and I think a lot of other people as well, is what really made Star Tours just an amazing experience. And just is that it was the first flight simulator type ride that really came out. And I think what was really cool is, at least for me, but I think to a lot of people I've also talked about with, is the first time you rode Star Tours you didn't really know what you were getting, um, at least back then, if you go back sort of towards to the eight, late 80s. When I went to, when I first saw it at Disneyland, I wasn't really expecting a lot. I was expecting, yeah, we're going to go in and we're going to see a movie or something like that. But I had no sense whatsoever of what a site, flight simulator was. I really didn't. I had no idea. And so when I got in there and experienced it, I was totally blown away. I mean, I was just... I could not believe what I had just experienced. It was just something so totally new, so totally unique. It, you know, if you ride a roller coaster, even if you rode, you know, you ride Big Thunder Mountain for the first time or you ride Space Mountain for the first time, as great as the experience is, you sort of know what you were getting into. And with Star Tours, I had absolutely no idea what what I was getting. I, it just it was such a total surprise and then just an amazing experience. I had a, a, a somewhat similar experience because I was down there with my younger brother, and I remember. When we saw it, I mean, we literally found ourselves almost kind of sprinting. And I specifically remember being in the queue. And when we saw the Star Speeder getting fixed by R2-D2 and C-3PO, my brother and I just looked at each other and we were like, oh, this is just way... I know we sound like such geeks, but like, my God, this is just way too cool. And I remember getting on and riding it over and over and over again. Because like you, we were blown away, not just by the detail and the fact that we had kind of Star Wars in 3D right in front of us, but the attraction for the technology perspective and the story it was telling uh, was just a real, real thrill for those of us that were, were big fans. Well, because it, what it did was the very nature of the ride, being the simulator, it was a total suspension of disbelief. I mean, it puts you in the very situation that you were supposed to be in so totally realistically via the flight simulator, via the screen. I mean, you really had the sense of that's what you were doing. You were riding in the star speeder in outer space. And, you know, in most other attractions, as great as they might be, Big Thunder, Space Mountain, whatever, you still had a sense of being in a theme park riding a ride. And with Star Tours, it was you were immersed 100 percent 
in that experience, and that's what it, I think it, uh, of Hall of Fame. You have your, you know, your Hall of Fame theme park attraction. That's why you know Star Tours certainly deserves to be at the, up near the top. I agree, and I, and I think that's still why it holds its own today. And we'll talk about you know what the future might hold for it. But I still really enjoy it. I mean, I am still a Star Wars fan, and I've seen that Star Tours film again. You know, probably more than a hundred times. But I still enjoy it. I still enjoy, like you said, that immersive experience that starts really as you approach the, the entire Star Tours area. Yeah, and, and that's where, you know, as I said, you know, we talked about how Disneyland kind of got it first and, you know, it, it had its, its kind of development history was centered on Disneyland. But let's face it, when it comes to, you know, the facade, the experience, you know, studios got got it hand down. I mean, when you when you walk up there and you've got a full scale at at there, I mean, yeah, you've got them beat. Exactly. And, you know, we talk about the story and we talk about all these different things and it really does begin out there. Um, and that the time frame that this is supposed to take place in is actually following Return of the Jedi, which is the third film in the Star Wars saga. We'll touch on this again later because there's a, there's a point about the timing of this that I want to kind of bring up to other uber geeks like myself but you know in addition like you said you've got that 35 foot at at walker that you know fires the mist out and makes all the noises and you can see the the footprint of it uh, under its raised leg and the entire ewok village um is just especially at night you go there at night and you hear the ewoks kind of sing and chanting um you know some of my distant relatives up there singing and chanting at night <laughs> it's really a wonderful experience yeah, the, the the entire you know exterior, the um, the ender, it was originally ender vendors, it then progressed to Tatooine traders, gift shop. Um, it it totally puts you in the Star Wars universe, right down to the smallest detail. Exactly, and even once you get through outside and you enter uh, this this maintenance hangar inside, which is on stage twelve, you'll see the sign for stage twelve because remember the studios was supposed to be sort of a real working studios, and everything takes place on a sound stage. This is where, again, my geek factor, I remember my brother really went through the roof because you see full-scale animatronic R2-D2 and C-3PO's working for this galactic travel agency. Again, that's part of the story. That's servicing the Star Tours fleet of the Star Speeder 3000. And you can see that the, the Star Speeder is, is battle damaged. And you'll hear a lot of the dialogue that goes on between R2 and, and 3PO about the repairs that they're doing. And you can recognize that Anthony Daniels, who was the voice and actor of C-3PO, actually came back and did the voiceover work for this. Um, it, again, talk about being immersed in the experience. It takes place for me right there. And, and again, here again, we have that perfect marriage of Disney and Lucasfilm with what is better, what can, what can be more better suited to audio animatronics than those two characters. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's perfect fit. They can be replicated almost perfectly, and even their very droid nature makes them a perfect fit for Audi animatronics because that makes them just all the more realistic. Exactly, and there's so much. This is, again, one of these places, Jeff, that I think if you get stuck in the queue, there's so much to see and so much to hear. So, for example, if you look to your sort of over your back left shoulder, depending on what you're looking at, you'll see a control room there, and you'll see forgive me as I start mentioning names, one of these Mon Calamari figures like Admiral Akbar um, from, uh, <laughs> sorry, from the original trilogy. But there's lots of great audio in there as well, and there's lots of great little audio cues that you can pick up. You'll hear reference to a red and black land speeder that's parked in a no-hover zone. That's THX 1138. Will the owner of a red and black land speeder vehicle ID THX 1138 Please return to your craft. You are parked in a no-hover area. THX 113, that's a, a reference that's made in all of George Lucas's films. It was his senior thesis and first real film. You'll, you'll also hear discussions about some of the other destinations that Star Tours may be going to, or you can go to, like going skiing or exploring the ice caverns on Hoth or the old abandoned Echo Base from Empire Strikes Back. You can ride a Tauntaun. You can go to the Moon of Endor, that's where our uh, trek is going to take us, or go to Tatooine and go to the Mos Eisley Cantina. Again, lots of great stuff in there, but Jeff, there's also a couple of other references to individuals, both real and fake, that I really like listening for. 
Yeah, Disney in these kind of situations loves loves to do those kind of audio amount announcements, as any fan of the TTA um, knows. But one of the really cool ones is Mr. Igrog Sakul, which is George Lucas spelled backwards. Departing Endor passenger Sakul, Mr. Igrog Sakul, please see the Star Tours agent at gate number three. And the other one is very interesting because it kind of pays homage to an older um, Tomorrowland attraction. And that is Mr. Tom Morrow paging Mr. Tom Morrow. And that was actually the character from uh, Flight to the Moon who later became Mr. Johnson in uh, Mission to Mars. And we'll see as we head into the next area in the Droid Repair Center that there are other references to other films, other attractions, and other individuals as well. Yeah, one of my favorite one of my favorite details again, and it's a very very hard detail to find because of the um, light levels it being very very dark, is the basically the kind of Kermit the Frog uh, sort of robotic skeleton that is seen kind of down under a ramp there, uh, kind of on a shelf, and it's almost to really catch most of the details on it. You almost have to take a flash picture of it and then look at your flash picture of it to, to really see how it's structured. It looks like Kermit. Yeah, and also right before you, when you kind of go up and around the ramp, before you go into the next sort of load area of the queue, there's also a reference there, and again, somewhat difficult to find unless you're looking for it, an old Disneyland attraction as well. Yeah, America Sings. There are, again, it's almost like you know they had an easy job of this because what they did was they stripped down to the mechanics um, two of the animal characters from America Sings. I believe they were geese and... They were, this was originally done for the, the Disneyland attraction, but then they duplicated the, it for um, the the Hollywood Studios version. Yeah, and there's lots of other stuff to look for, too. On the right-hand side, you'll see a, a G29T droid working on um, an R2 unit there. That This one has a bad motivator, just like the same one. It's the same little red R2 unit that blew up at the beginning of Episode 4, and that's how uh, Luke Skywalker ends up getting R2-D2. There are other announcements that you listen to in the queue that I'm not going to spoil for you, but uh, sometimes you have to kind of listen closely. And, of course, always look up because there are uh, boxes kind of going overhead with parts in them. And on there, there are stenciled letters and numbers. Those stand, like you'll see many places in Walt Disney World, for the initials and usually birth dates of Imagineers that worked on the attraction. One one other detail I really love, because I only really kind of caught it recently, and once again it was when... We were actually waiting in the line. Um, we hit it at a time where there was a wait. If you look down, what, what's really interesting is the details in looking down. And you, as you're going on the queue ramps, you you feel like you're way above this sort of almost huge, huge kind of set piece. And again, very basic um, optical illusions were incorporated to give this whole area a degree of scope. And one of the things, if you kind of look, you can see that it's kind of the old, just kind of the tricky mirror effect where they've placed a mirror to actually extend the depth of the set piece. And it, it's really almost because of the, the lighting levels, it works almost perfectly because it it was almost very hard to even denote that it was a mirror the way they had set it up. And it was just really excellent, excellent work on Imagineering's part. And again, it's a queue that I don't mind spending time in. And, and there are many times that there's nobody in the queue and I'll spend time and kind of walk through slowly and take pictures of some of the cool things that you can look for and try and spot. Especially if you are a big fan, you'll find props that look like they came right out of the movies. But from that Droid Gnostic Center, you go into the boarding area and you'll see your pre-show video. Um, that's hosted by a woman played by Jennifer Lewis. She's got her sort of Half a Princess Leia hairdo going on. She's got half a cinnamon roll on one head. Again, the passengers in the ride video are Imagineers and their family, but you can also find an Ewok in there as well as a Chewie, another one of those Mon Calamaris, and they were kind of big orange heads with big fish eyes, for those of you that might not be familiar with what I'm talking about. And if you look carefully as you start to board the vehicle, Jeff, you'll see that the Star Speeder is really just sort of painted on the side of a large rectangular box that's on a series of hydraulic lifts it's, it's, I never quite caught that, See that? I'm, I'm, I was so absorbed in, in, in the reality of it all though. well they were you need to put your lightsaber away and, and strap yourself in because <laughs> well you know I was but I, was on, I wanted to touch on something because one of the most enjoyable moments that I personally like so much 
about the the loading video is when the Admiral Ackbar type character really comes close to backhanding the kid with the camera. I mean, it's very, very. I mean, it's like you could tell. I mean, he was ready just to haul off and hit the kid. It was great. Or the or the uh, the alien that's smoking, or the one with three eyes. It was you know when you're not supposed yeah. to take any flash pictures. So. <laughs> But, and you know there is that one that one little creature, and I'm sure we'll get email or, or phone calls saying, identifying just what it is by people who are even more geeky than we are. But then you know the one whose feet don't touch the floor. And if, if he was riding Soren, he'd have to use the little strap in the middle to, to, to buckle. Let him. me save everybody the trouble. It's going to be a Lou Mangello joke in there somewhere. So let's just move along. I do meet the 40 inch height requirement if I'm wearing the correct shoes. So, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, Diana stuff socks in the bottom. So you, yeah. So, inside the ride itself, we are introduced to another new character. And obviously, it's somebody who has a very familiar voice, especially for us, like us, Jeff, who are kind of kids of the same generation. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because that's the funny thing that, you know, after time went by, most everybody came to recognize and, and acknowledge that it was Paul Rubens, more famously known as, as Pee Wee Herman. But it was interesting is that back then, it was one of those things that when you rode the ride, it was... That, that voice, I know that voice. And I, I remember being on it with so many different people saying, who does the voice? Who does the voice? Because I know that voice. And it's just a, just a, enough of a slight variation on his Pee Wee Herman character to get you thinking about it. But it, you just wouldn't immediately make that association with Star Wars. So it kind of wasn't a slam dunk identification for you. Yeah, now he actually appeared in, in a somewhat similar role, too, in another Disney film. That was Flight of the Navigator in 1986. He played Max, the sort of artificial intelligence spaceship so it's kind of a a similar role uh, for him in a similar time yeah and take a quick look at rex when they drop down the uh the cockpit shield you can see he has a long right uh red tag on him that says warning remove before flight obviously which was not removed that's actually a reference to tags that are sometimes put on airplane parts uh before obviously it's supposed to take off and maybe that's the reason that our adventure begins and of course jeff things go horribly wrong in a pleasant kind of way. Exactly. In a very fun kind of way. And, of course, as things start to go bad, one of mine and, and many other people's favorite lines is spoken. And he says, I have a very, a very bad feeling about this. That is a running gag in all of the Star Wars films. Um, Obi-Wan Kenobi says it in episode one. Anakin says it. Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia. I won't go on. But it, it's in something. And it's actually, believe it or not, it's also uttered in... Uh, Indiana Jones in Disneyland too. It's a it's a total it's a Lucasism. It's a, a Lucas. Oh, I like that. So, but yeah, we're supposed and to. Be I on think, our I little... think Michael Jackson doesn't Michael Jackson even say it. <laughs> <laughs> that and THX. Oh no! Don't send your emails. I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's Jeff Pepper at 2719. <laughs> but yeah, so we're supposed to be on this 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 nice leisurely tour uh, to the moon of Endor. And somehow, some way, we are uh, we we come out of hyperspace and we go through uh, a, a series of like frozen comets. We're drawn into this combat with the Imperial T- Star Destroyer, and then of course the best part, Jeff, is when we go through the Death Star battle and get into that trench scene that I know for all of us as kids just kind of blew us away. And that's the thing that I loved about the attraction when I first wrote it, and when I still write it now, is that first person perspective that they use that that same perspective that we had when we saw the movie and were blown away by that trench scene we now have throughout the entire film yeah you're 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 on a ship that's that's getting back to what i was saying about what was so and still is in many ways so totally unique about star tours is the very design of the attraction the very nature of the simulator you're you're not in a simulator you're on a ship and you're there you go and it and it brings it home I, you know, you're you're ducking your head as you're as you're as you're weaving in and out and going up and down through the various Death Star surface obstructions and towers and antennas and things like that. You're instinctually ducking your head during that part of the film. And the thing that I always felt about this attraction compared to, say, Body Wars, which use a similar uh, vehicle, was that I always felt that Star Tours was much more fluid than Body Wars. And I don't know if it's because of what you were seeing on screen or the programming of it, but I never had any kind of problem with it. I always enjoyed sort of that, that bouncing around that you do on Star Tours. Yeah, again, because it, it was something you could relate to. I think Body Wars took things a little bit further to the point where, you know, it was just kind of all over the map. But 
Star Tours, you, 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 once you knew you were on that spaceship, you had the sense of it was doing exactly what it needed to do in terms of to making the experience work for you. Even as the ride comes to a close and you kind of skid your way into the landing bay and you almost hit that fuel tanker that's right in, in front of you, which, by the way, the registration number is actually Lucasfilm's old phone number. Don't bother calling it because it's, it's no longer in use. Uh, and there's been a long-standing rumor, Jeff, that the guy behind the glass that you almost crash into is George Lucas. It's actually not. Um, it's actually an uh, ILM model maker named Ira Keeler. Uh, George Lucas does not appear anywhere in the attraction, although there are other ILM people like Dennis Murin and his crew that, that you can find. They kind of insert themselves in one of them's Red Leader and other spots throughout the attraction as well. And that, that brings up another interesting detail in the film in, in, with that particular scene where that he is behind the glass there in, in the booth or whatever. He's using an old-fashioned telephone. You know, this this amazing high-tech Star Wars universe and he... And he uses a regular phone. All right. If we're going to, if we're going to pick it, <laughs> I was going to say this for later, but one aspect of, you know, the star Wars universe goes far beyond the, just the six films. And there are countless video games. There are animated series. There's a new clone wars film that's coming out later this year. There are probably hundreds of books and comic books and things like that. And, and they've actually adopted Star Tours, sort of into this extended universe, as they call it. it. Star Tours is made reference to in a lot of these books and comics, and even some of the video games. And some aspects of the ride, they've actually sort of taken as sort of Star Wars law, you know, lore and, and canon. But there, there is something that, that I'm, I and I'm sure other geeks that don't just sit there and enjoy the ride picked out is that, of course, we talked about going through the trench scene of the Death Star. Well, I think we all remember not one but two Death Stars being destroyed in in Episode 4 and Episode uh, 6, which is when this is supposed to take place. So, you know, what Death Star is now, the story is that, well, this was sort of a prototype Death Star. This was like the sample Death Star. So now there's been three that have been blown up. Yeah, it's stretching it. (laughs) <laughs> but well, it's a stretch. It's a stretch. But you know what? That's what we said. My brother, the first thing he came up to me, because I was, well, wait a minute. You know, it's cool ride and all, but how, how are we going to the Death Star? They they blew up the Death Star, and, and it was it. What and it was interesting is the what well, the first. That's why I've never like the whole canon thing. I, I never really took that seriously myself because it, it it just didn't work to some extent. But what when, when I first saw the film, the, there's the one line in it where the pilot says, you know, Star Tours, what are you doing here? This is a combat zone. I almost took it to to interpret it as such that because if Star Tours could get so easily into this place that it must have been like a simulation or like a war games kind of set up that it wasn't an actual an actual Death Star it was just kind of just you know war game exercises or something like that so that was kind of my take on it. And this is right where a lot of people are going. You know what? Why can't you guys just sit back and ride the ride? <laughs> <laughs> you know? You're worried about the Death Star trench and when it takes place and the expanded universe and. Okay. Well, Lou, I don't really think that's the correct theory. <laughs> so, what's your theory, thing. Jeff? <laughs> and another thing, buddy. It was was it all, it was all a dream, wasn't it? That's <laughs> the stable, You know, for the stabilizers to work properly, you just can't have that kind of mechanic daring do going on. <laughs> Listen, your mom's calling you from upstairs. Get out of the basement. So. <laughs> but the the attraction actually doesn't end for me and for a lot of us when the ride ends because you are let out into a shop, and that's okay. Like you said, it was originally called Endor Vendors. Now it's called Tatooine Traders. And again, it doesn't really make much sense in the whole lineage of things because you just went to Endor, but that's beside the point. Uh, that changed, I think, around 98, 99 somewhere. But again, the theming on the outside is great. And if you are a Star Wars fanboy, this is just Nerdvana for you. I love how you put Star Wars fan and boy there together in that sentence. <laughs> it's very creative. <laughs> Uh, if you're Jeff, do you remember the old Endor vendors? Now, obviously, the, the exterior now looks like it belongs on Tatooine. It's got those uh, rusty, tan-colored round buildings. The original exit looked like that sort of um, the the bunker that was on the Endor yeah, it was, moon. Yeah, it was an extension. It was an extension of the Endor facade, and it was the bunker door there where Leia and Han Solo and their kind of group of soldiers were storming in to disable the tractor beam. Oh my God, I sound like <laughs> geek here. But yeah, that's how that was originally designed. It, it kind of went with the overall indoor theme of the exterior. And 
I guess there, you know, a lot of people pointed out, oh, well, now it's inconsistent that it's, you know, it's Tatooine traders. But it also goes back to the, you know, like you said, when you walk into the original entrance, this isn't a rec- literal, a literal recreation of Endor. It is a movie set. It's, it's much as you, like the signs are marked on, you know, that you're going into a studio set piece here, not, not an actual recreation. Well, well, we'll talk about the future of it too. But there's been rumors for a long time, even going back uh, into the into the '90s of the mid '90s, really, of the attraction being updated. And and when the first film in the new trilogy came out, for a long time, the rumor was that it was going to be a pod racing change of scenery, and that's what the new attraction was going to be. That's what the new film was going to be. So the theory might be, well, in anticipation for that change, that's where they brought Tatooine in. But it, it doesn't matter because the store inside is really the important part, and there you can get all kinds of unique Star Wars figures. You can get the mashup figures like Jedi Mickey and Mini Leia. There's about 15 different, if you collect the Star Wars figures, there's about 15 different Star Tours droids that you can get. So if you're a collector, you can actually add those to the collection. There's plushes, some cool shirts, lots of signed authentic collectibles. Um, I, I have been looking for forever but still cannot find. There was an old... A uh, die-cast parade vehicle of Luke Starspeeder that had R2-D2 and C-3PO in it. If anybody has one, please let me know. Um, I need to complete like a collection of die-casts. You can also build your own lightsaber in there, too. You don't need to go to downtown Disney in order to do it. That is, is very, very cool. Um, and it's just one of many different types of lightsabers you can get if, if that's your thing. Not that I ever bought one, but that's what I hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, let's talk about... The, you know, I mentioned briefly... The update, because there's been a rumor for a long, long time that Star Tours was going to be updated. It goes back to the mid-90s. Back in 2005, at a Celebration 3 fan event, Star Wars fan event, George Lucas did say that the attraction at the studios would be getting an overhaul soon. Of course, three years have gone by. There have been rumors over the past few months. Um, I can tell you that I know for a fact that Star Tours, if you want to call it 2.0, will be coming um, at some time relatively soon. There were a couple of hiccups in things that were going on, but it is coming. It is supposed to be a 3D attraction. You're going to use these new 3D-themed polarized glasses. You're going to have five rear-projected Disney digital 3D screens in the front, and they're also, Jeff, going to update the entire hydraulic lift mechanism. And is this... This is something that, again, you know, part of the other thing we were hearing, hearing tidbits of, I believe, was that Anthony Daniel at some point that he had been recording dialogue. And so there was a lot of stuff, you know, floating around out there. So is your sense of it, Lou, that this has been actually in production to some extent? I mean, we had heard also, I think you'd even mentioned, I, I don't know if you'd mentioned on the show, there were rumors that they were actually testing stuff out in in the Body Wars simulators over at Epcot. I mean, any any credence to any of that? I don't. I mean, that's what I had heard. Um, I, well, I can't attest to what's going on over at Wonders of Life. What I had heard recently from uh, a very reliable source was that Star Tours 2.0, again, we can call it, is definitely coming. Um, I don't have a time frame as yet. It's obviously going to take a number of years probably for it to be retrofitted, especially if they're going to change the entire hydraulic mechanism um, for the number of Star Speeders that are in there. Well, it was funny. I did, it was very kind of a funny story that I have from quite years, but a few years back, and you, you probably have memories of this too, but the rumors that always surrounded Star Wars were very funny because the, the George Lucas sightings at the studios and at Disneyland almost became tantamount to like Elvis sightings to where, <laughs> you know, you would hear cast members talking amongst themselves that, oh yes, George Lucas was here last week, so that that's, that's an indication that we're going to have the simulator switch out, because I, I remember a, a cast member back in the mid '90s, just swore uphill and downhill that Lucas has been been out to visit, and that that the simulators were going to change, and you were going to have three different destinations. And and now looking back, it was all just kind of somebody's imagination gone wild. But it was it was one of the it was almost you know the bus drivers weren't talking about it so much, but it was being circulated among the the studio cast members a lot. Well, I haven't looked, but I'm sure if you go online, probably now is about the right time that you'll start hearing things like. George Lucas is going to be there for the first weekend of Star Wars weekends, and he'll be checking into the Beach Club because he needs to watch A, B, C, and D and see what's going on. Uh, again, you probably have a better chance of Elvis showing up at the Beach Club for Star right. Wars weekends. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I just saw 
George Lucas and Anthony Daniels at the food court in Pop Century. So <laughs> that's the kind of stuff that you'll start getting. But um, until we get something official for Disney, you know, the the rumors from Disney fans and from Star Wars fans are going to continue, especially when these kind of events um, come up. And Jeff, we'll talk more about Star Wars weekends in the upcoming weeks. Um, I, I'm really, really looking forward to going down that first weekend and seeing all the different activities. And we'll kind of cover that and do a sort of uh, a preview guide for what you expect if you are going to head down any of those weekends in June. But as far as Star Tours is concerned, is this a ride for you that you still go on every time that you go, or is it a eh, if I have time kind of thing? Oh, every time, absolutely, and and typically multiple times. And fortunately, it, at the studios, even during very very crowded times, you can typically not have a very long wait. Um, I. My our experience with it is has been usually it's usually a walk on or at the very most a fifteen to twenty minute wait if it's a, at a busier time. So yeah, it's always a must do. It's 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 almost instinctual. We don't even talk about it. We just walk that direction and get in line. It's not it's not even a negotiable thing. And now they have the uh, the Jedi Training Academy, the permanent stage, the left hand side of the Adat Walker. I'm sure you like me wish that we could do it. It's only for kids, but that's something really cool too. Another one of those interactive things and i think it's brought additional popularity back to the attraction as well and a nice little hidden treasure nearby is kind of hidden off to the side across the way there is the speeder bike photo opportunity which again we are big enough to do and i don't care what anybody says (laughs) (laughs) well i think jeff you should post a picture of you on the speeder bike on your blog after you come back from your your next family trip okay i will (laughs) So that is our exciting boy. You know, I thought we geeked out. I really thought we hit the max when we did 45 minutes on the Jungle Cruise queue. I, I think we may have outdone ourselves. I'm not sure if that's a good thing <laughs> talking about. And, we, and we just barely scraped the top of the iceberg. On this. <laughs> <laughs> when you're, I mean, we restrained ourselves, I feel. <laughs> you know, we tried not to rattle. I mean, there's a lot more trivia. You can, I'll put a link over to, um, to my trivia site where you can get some more sort of geeky facts and things to look for and enjoy in the attraction and the queue. Uh, But you're right, and and that's the beauty of it, is that there's so much to see and so much to do and so much to enjoy. And um, I'm looking forward to, like I said, looking forward to Star Wars weekends, not looking forward to the crowds. I kind of like enjoy right now being able to walk on Star Tours for the most part during the less crowded times of year. But uh, it definitely holds up. Definitely one of my favorite attractions, certainly over at the studios. So Jeff Pepper, as always, my friend, may the force be with you. May the force be with you as all my Padawan. You're supposed to say, and also with you, but it's okay. <laughs> See you next time, buddy. <laughs> Her name was Leia. She was a princess with a Danish on each ear and our theater drawing near. So I to D2 found Ben Kenobi. Obi-Wan. He'd have to put the Death Star plans into the Rebellion's hands. So Luke and Obi-Wan had to get to Alderaan. So they stopped into Mos Eisley to have a drink with Han at the Star Wars, Star Wars Wars Cantina. Cantina. The weirdest creatures you've ever seen. I've always said that what makes Walt Disney World such a truly special and really magical place is not the parks or the attractions or the shows or the food or the resorts or anything else like that it really is the cast member and a few weeks ago i had the opportunity to meet and sit down with tc newman she is one of the two 2008 walt disney world ambassadors who really embodies and represents each and every one of the more than 60,000 cast members in orlando And we had a chance to talk about her role and the selection process and sort of what her day-to-day duties are. So I want to share with you part of my interview with TC and start off by welcoming her to the show. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Hello, listeners. (laughs) This is very exciting for me. And, uh, you know, I said when we first sat down, um, and then I'll preface the interview by saying I think that you really do have probably the greatest job in, in Walt Disney World. I'd have to agree with you. This has been an amazing few months, and I know as the year progresses, it's going to be wonderful. Absolutely. Well, tell us, before we talk about the role of ambassador, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I grew up in Southern California, 
just in the shadows of Disneyland and have been an annual pass holder at the Disneyland Park since I was nine years old. So it's always been a passion of mine. I, uh, my parents actually honeymooned here at Walt Disney World back in 1972, so I think somehow Mickey was in my blood. <laughs> You caught the, the the magic, so quote unquote, um, very early on. What about um, how do you got started with the Disney Company? Was it here at Walt Disney World? Did it start off in Southern California? It actually started at Disneyland in 1996. I was hired into the entertainment department. I was one of the performers and got to bring some of our fairy tales to life. All right, tell us a little bit about the ambassador position itself, how you actually started the application process, and what sort of that, the steps that you went through in the interview process before you were actually um, given the title. Well, I would say for me that the steps to, be, to becoming an ambassador started long before the interview process. I remember seeing the ambassadors as a cast member at Disneyland and wanting so badly to do what they did. And so years later, I finally went out for the role at the end of 2006 for the 2007 ambassador team. Did not make it that time, but I gained great friends, a lot of confidence, and took the feedback that they gave me and really applied that to the 2008 process, which thankfully I got to hear Meg Crofton say my name, along with Carrie McPherson's over at the Theater of the Wild at Disney's Animal Kingdom. It was a moment I will never, ever, ever forget. But the process to becoming an ambassador is a long interview process. It starts off with a panel of managers, people who really want to know what the cast member who will be the ambassador will be doing to represent them. And then from there, we cut the field of about 120 people to 17. And the 17 of us participated in a role play exercise, as well as going through another interview process with a panel of people on the director or general manager level. Then from there, that field was cut to nine. And we interviewed with Meg Crofton, president of Walt Disney World Resort, along with vice presidents and her steering committee, and got a chance to really delve into yourself, not only yourself as a cast member, but but who you are as a person outside of Disney. And from there, they made the selection, and this year it was myself and Carrie. I I can only imagine how exciting that must have been. But you talked about the process, and, and really... You are the official representative of all of the 62,000 cast members, which is obviously a very daunting task. But did the cast members themselves play any part in the selection process of who was going to be out there for 2008 representing them? Well, all of the cast members who are on the panel, excuse me, all of the people who are on the panels are cast members and have come from all ranks, meaning some of them started um, in our park, some of them have started in administrative positions. So all of them have a vested interest. The ambassador team truly represents all of the cast members, no matter what their role is. All right, so speaking of roles in the ambassador, what exactly does the Walt Disney World ambassador do? What are some of your your duties um, and sort of your your day-to-day roles? We have a great role, and a big part of it is truly encouraging our cast, being a part of the celebrations that go on here at Walt Disney World, such as our environmentality commitment, our commitments to diversity, and as well as celebrating cast member milestone anniversaries, safety records, and then outside of Walt Disney World, we represent our 62,000 cast members in the media, doing podcasts such as this, (laughs) radio interviews, television interviews, print interviews. Just really taking the wonderful things that our cast members are doing on a daily basis out into the rest of the world. So I assume that obviously every day for you is is very different. What, what's a typical like a typical week like for TC, the Walt Disney World ambassador? A typical week for me is. Wow, it's varied. Every week has been different ever since January 1st when I officially started the position. But I would say that we have a lot of cast member celebrations, so there's a lot of driving involved. We've got 47 square miles of property here. So driving back and forth between different resorts and parks and celebrating cast member milestones. Uh, Also, I would say every week or so we have at least one or two interviews come up so that we can uh, really get that Disney message out out there. We want to encourage our guests to come and visit us, and we want to show them the wonderful things that Disney as a corporation is doing in the community. 
Do you ever get a chance to get back into the parks and interact with guests? I'm sure there must be something if you don't, you, you probably get to miss. We do get a chance to go out into the parks. Um, we miss it. We miss doing it um, more often. But between uh, events, we certainly walk the parks and say hello and, and do our best to have some guest service and some special magical moments with our guests. Yeah, like I said, you, you have obviously one of what I assume is probably one of the most coveted you know, cast member positions. And you're really following in such a long tradition that really started with Walt himself. People might not realize this began back in Disneyland for its 10th anniversary when Walt was just sort of inundated with media requests. You know, what does it feel like having such a, a, an honor like this and such a long story tradition? It is such an honor. It's such a gift to be able to trace your role all the way back to Walt Disney himself. When Walt chose Julie Ream to be the first Disneyland ambassador, he needed some help. And I think that truly embodies what the Walt Disney World ambassador does. We are there to support. We support our cast. We support our guests. We support Walt Disney World. And to go from Julie Ream at Disneyland to Debbie Dane Brown here at Walt Disney World, who is our 1971 ambassador, we have a long tradition that, that dates back to Walt Disney. But as each year progresses, we have added new innovations. We have added more diversity to our ambassador family and just made it a well-rounded organization. It's a, a thrill. I'm so excited to be adopted into this <laughs> ambassador family. They've taken Carrie and I in, and we are just so proud to represent not only our 62,000 cast members, but the ambassadors who've gone before us. That's wonderful. And I assume now, in just the few months that you've had the position, I have to assume that you've seen and been able to experience some truly, you know, we use the word magical things. What are some of the notable, or, or for you personally, some of the more memorable things you had occasion to do just so far? Wow, there are so many. And you would think in three months that it would be easy to pick a few, but it's actually very difficult. I would say one of the highlights for both Carrie and myself, I feel comfortable speaking for her on this behalf, was our global training. When we start the ambassador process, the training, the teams from around the world meet at Disneyland, and we were able to experience the Disneyland Resort as well as the Walt Disney Studios and Walt Disney Imagineering. And while we were there, we got to test ride Toy Story Mania, which is coming to Disney's California Adventure and here to Disney's Hollywood Studios. So exciting, so much fun, and I will tell you, all of the guests who are waiting to go on it, it's worth the wait. You are going to absolutely love it. But beyond that, I would say that most of the memorable experiences for me have had to do with cast members, hearing their stories, the Walt Disney Company is a, is a storytelling company. Starting with Walt, he told stories through his drawings, and he told stories through his theme parks. And there's a story behind each of our cast members, why they're here and why they remain here. And as Carrie and I go out through our property, people have told us what keeps them a Disney cast member. And it's so inspiring, and it makes you want to hang on for 35, 40 years. I'll be retiring from this company, no doubt about it. I mean, that's one of the things, too, is that you are taking on the role during what I and I'm sure a lot of other guests feel is a very exciting time for the company with the Year of a Million Dreams. When we talk about the cast members, and I know personally that seeing how the, the cast members now are empowered to do so much more to enhance the guest experience, be above and beyond just giving away some of the incredible prizes, um, it's really great to see because that passion and that love for what they do, which is really just kind of making guests happy, really comes through, and, and you're very representative of that. It's so true. Our, our cast members have a passion for people, and more specifically, our guests. And if making that vacation experience is going to have that guest go back home and remember Disney fondly, it's just completely worth it. What I love about the Year of a Million Dreams is that we have empowered all of our cast members not only to give material goods, but to give their time. To take that time to find out what's going on with our guests. Where are they from? Or what brings you here? Who did you come with? Because all of that can really make a difference for our guests and for their vacation experience. 
Uh, Carrie and myself teach a class over at the Disney University called The Evolution and Philosophy of Disney Guest Service and Showmanship. And what it does is really trace our roots of guest service all the way back to Walt Disney and our first training programs and how that has evolved into a culture of guest service so that anyone who comes here is truly going to be immersed into a guest service oriented society. And that's what Walt Disney World really is. Yeah. And, and like I said, the, the passion that the, the cast members have really comes through in you and you make an excellent representative for them. Um, is there anything looking forward to 2008 specifically that you're really looking forward to or is it just you know sort of the, the, the journey is as exciting as the destination? Well, this has been an amazing journey just getting here, but 2008 has so many wonderful things coming up for Walt Disney World. We've got the 10th anniversary of Disney's Animal Kingdom. They've done so many amazing things with that theme park, as well as with animal conservation and animal programs. We're just so proud of our cast members there and all of their accomplishments. So on Earth Day, April 22nd, we will certainly be celebrating their decade of it of existence. And beyond that, we know over at Disney's Hollywood Studios, the opening of Toy Story Mania is truly going to revolutionize that side of the park. And we've just opened the Block Party Bash at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Again, an amazing parade, something that the entire family is going to enjoy. So as the year progresses, more and more wonderful things are coming up for not only our company, for our cast members to experience, but for all of our guests to experience. Now, let me ask you this. It it might seem like a a silly question, but everyone in in the Walt Disney World cast and every cast member obviously wears their costume when they're on stage. You are dressed in your beautiful blue suit with that very, very um, distinguishing ambassador pin. When you are out as an ambassador, do you also have to sort of keep to that same Disney look and and wear a costume as well? Absolutely. This is a costume that you're looking at, and all of the clothes that Carrie and I will be wearing for the next year are costumes. Uh, Because the Ambassador Program has such a long history, we do have to be concerned with keeping that classic Disney look. And so everything that you see me wearing is a part of my costume, including the pin. Uh, The pin, which I love, it's my favorite piece of jewelry currently. (laughs) It is um, actually made by the same company that made the uh, Olympic medals for the Salt Lake City Olympics. And I can wear it for one year, unless after this year I do anything on official ambassador business. That is the only time I'll be allowed to put it on. So I am relishing every day that I get to put this on. But you get to keep it at the end. I do get to keep it. It will be a part of my history forever. And we were saying, fortunately, the, the, we've graduated away from some of the 70s plaid. You, you look very, um, you know, you look wonderful in your blue suit. And is it kind of a, the same costume all the time, or do you have like a variety of different things you get to wear? We do have a variety of suits and, and casual wear, depending on the occasion, because, of course, if we were out at Disney's Wide World of Sports, it might be a little overdressed to come in in a full suit. So we do have a more casual costume for that occasion. And uh, currently, of course, our colors for Ambassador are red and blue. So currently our costumes are in that red and blue family. We have steered away from the plaid. It's definitely a classic, but we are not doing that at the moment. <laughs> Cla- classic in quotes. How diplomatic of you to say cl- <laughs> classic. Um, do you ever get a chance to travel you know, beyond the States you know, to Disneyland? Do you get to go overseas at all? Absolutely. We have already visited Disneyland and Disney's California Adventure. We've also gotten a chance to travel around the state of Florida because, of course, all of our Disney fans are going to know that we have Disney's Vero Beach Resort a little further south in Florida. We've gotten to visit our cast members there. We will be visiting Disney's Hilton Head Resort. And my partner, Carrie, will actually be going out to Tokyo Disney Resort to celebrate their 25th anniversary this April, which is so exciting. And together this July... Carrie and I will be taking the trip over to Germany to go on an Adventures by Disney trip. We will get a chance to see the castle that inspired Walt Disney to draw Sleeping Beauty Castle and have a chance to go through the beautiful country there that really inspired Walt. It's just so exciting. What's also wonderful about that trip is that our worldwide ambassador team will be coming and joining us. So our ambassador team from Paris, California, Tokyo, and Hong Kong will all be meeting us there. 
I don't need to look back at my notes, but I'm sure I said something about you having the best job in Disney. <laughs> I think you, I think we've, we've sort of uh, definitely shown that that's true. It is the truth. So exciting. And I can see as we sit across the table when you talk about these things, I can see the excitement in your face and you truly do love what you do. And certainly the selection of you as the 2008 Walt Disney World Ambassador was a perfect one. And I think the 62,000 people that you represent should be very proud um, to have you out here in the community representing them. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Carrie and I love what we do. This is going to be a very difficult role to give up on <laughs> December 31st, but I will tell you this has been an amazing year and certainly a, a year of a million dreams for me personally, and our cast members has truly made that happen for me. So you took my line. I was to say it was a year of a million dreams for you too. Uh, TC, thank you so much for taking some time out of what I obviously is a very busy schedule for you um, to sit and talk with, with me and, and for my listeners, and I hope have occasion to see you again throughout the year. I hope so too. Thank you so much and we'll hear from you soon, listeners. Thank you to everybody that has been sending in your emails with questions and feedback. I only have time just for a few this week, so let's go ahead and get started. The first comes from Rich Bernardo. He said, Hi Lou, as always and usual, enjoy this week's show regarding Toy Story Mania, and we are looking forward to going there on our trip this July. As we are getting up there, I'm pretty sure we won't be able to go to Tower and know we won't be able to go to Aerosmith, so what would be the best strategy for hitting Toy Story Mania? Head there first thing in the morning? Is it fast pass or what? I know you said to enjoy the queue line, but we don't want to enjoy it for most of the morning. What do you think? Regards, Rich. Rich, clearly this attraction is going to change not just the landscape of Disney's Hollywood Studios, but how you have to prepare and how you have to tour. For many people who want to hit the big name attractions first thing in the morning, they would run down Sunset Boulevard, grab a fast pass, say for Tower of Terror, go hit Rock and Roller Coaster, then hit go back to Tower of Terror. Now you got to think a little bit differently and bring Toy Story Mania in the mix. Me, personally, what I would do is, first thing in the morning, I would head right for Toy Story Mania. I would grab a fast pass and then get on the attraction. Then I would head over to Sunset Boulevard, hit either Rock and Roller Coaster or Tower of Terror. Depending on the time, you might be able to pick up a fast pass for the other one at that time. Head back to Pixar Place and ride Toy Story Mania again because, believe me, you are definitely going to want to ride this attraction more than one time. And if you hit it the way I talked about, you can experience the full queue as well as get to experience the Fast Pass queue by riding it from the standby line first thing in the morning and via the Fast Pass line later on in the day. Next question comes from Brian Grimm who said, Lou, I'm looking for the name of a website that posts Walt Disney World wait times in real times. I can't find any information on this, any ideas. Brian, I actually have not heard of Walt Disney World posting live real-time wait times. I do know that there is another Orlando-based theme park that shall remain nameless that does provide somewhat real-time updated wait times for their attractions via a website address that you can access from your mobile phone. So basically, while you're in the park, no matter where you are, you can use your cell phone with web access to check the wait times for any of the other attractions. Now, I don't know if Walt Disney World is planning on doing this. What I did have on the show was somebody who came on and talked about the in-park Nintendo DS system. That was a, a system that was in a trial run a number of months ago where you'd basically rent one of these handheld Nintendo DS devices, and part of what it did was give you real-time wait times. And I believe that is now out of the testing phase, and Disney has not announced any formal plans to implement this in the Magic Kingdom or any of the other theme parks. Now, if there is a website that maybe I'm missing that somebody knows about where Disney does post the live real-time wait times for the attractions, please email me, let me know. I'll put it up in the show notes. Next email is from John Beals. said, Hey, Lou, I recently just took a Mama and Me trip down to Disney World at the very beginning of May. I would disagree that this time of year isn't crowded. It seemed like there were hundreds of school groups down there for an end-of-the-year field trip. Almost all the rooms of the Valley Resorts were booked by then, but my mom and I still had a pleasant time. I noticed something, though, that I was curious about. Behind the Imagination and Canada Pavilion is this blue sky-colored building. It seemed like a big warehouse or something. What was it? Is it part of the Imagination ride, or is it where they store things for shows or past parades? 
I was wondering if you could fill my mom in on what that building is for. Thanks so much. Love the books, podcast, and your audio guide, John. John, the building you're referring to is relatively new. That is actually the show building for Soren. And although it looks like it might be close to the Imagination Pavilion, it's actually right behind it, attached to the Land Pavilion. And that obviously opened back in 2005. And a number of guests actually have noticed the blue building, say it doesn't really fit in with the theming, especially if you're on the World Showcase Promenade by Canada and you see it in the distance. Now, there was a rumor for a long time that Canada would be getting a new attraction, possibly a a flume ride based on the Brother Bear film. That was going to be large enough to cover up that show building that you see in the distance, but obviously that has not come to pass as yet. And based on how far out we are from the Brother Bear movie, I would venture to say that that attraction, at least in that incarnation with the Brother Bear theme, probably won't happen. But to answer your question, you are looking at the show building or one of the show buildings, as there may be another one coming in the future, for Soren over at the land. Next email comes from Adam Zoldak. Adam, uh, I want to thank you for the comments that you made in the first paragraph. I won't read them on the show, but I really appreciate it. Glad you like the show. But your question is this. What are the best town car services from MCO, which is Orlando International Airport, to the Disney area hotels and vacation homes like Windsor Palms? I found a couple by Google, but have you ever used one of these services or what service have, have you used and can you recommend? There seem to be a dozen or so, probably more, and I have no idea what one would be the best and most reliable. I appreciate your help, Adam. Adam, thanks for the great question, because there are a number of limousine and town car services that are in the Orlando area for people that may not want to use something like Disney's Magical Express. Uh, I personally have used, and I've recommended in the past, Quicksilver Tours and Transportation. They're located at quicksilver-tours.com. That's who I used before I just got into the habit of really renting a car every time I go down because I just found it easier for me to sort of get around that way. But that's who I've used. That's who I like. They also do things like they'll have a free 30-minute grocery stop. Uh, They will meet you inside the airport. You don't have to worry about going outside. There are, uh, if you need car seats or booster seats, they can help you out like with that. And they also have a phone in the car. If you want to make a call, let people know that you arrived. I was always very happy with their service. Their prices were very competitive. I believe now they start at around just under $50, uh, transfers to and from the airport. That, again, is quicksilver-tours.com. You did mention a couple of the other ones, Tiffany Town Cars and Prestige Town Cars. I have not personally used either, so I really can't speak to them. But you could probably also go on the forums at disneyworldtrivia.com. Go to the vacation planning section. You'll probably find some recommendations, maybe some comments from other people that may have used one or more of these services. Jared T. from Clearwater, Florida, has a question about the show itself. He said, Lou, love the show. I've been listening since episode one. One thing I look forward to each week are your show opens, the montages of Disney sound clips, which you edit together as if going through a radio dial. I've noticed that sometimes the sound clips follow the theme of the episode. The recent Animal Kingdom show comes to mind, and sometimes they seem to be completely random. Do you have a plan when you put these together every week? Or do you just start going through your sound archive and start grabbing whatever sounds strike your fancy? I'd really be interested to hear how you put these together. Keep up the great work, Jared. Jared, as evidenced by this week's show, clearly I was following a theme. Uh, I was very excited about the Star Tours DSi. And oftentimes if there is a prominent theme for a show, I might try and pick out one or more sound clips to put at the beginning Other times, it might just be something that hits me even when I'm driving in the car and say, wow, you know, I want to make sure I use this sound clip this week or something while I'm listening to my iPod. Or like you said, as I'm going through the archives, uh, I spend a great deal of time kind of going through trying to find some fun or funny or some of the old sound clips to maybe rekindle some nostalgia from some of the old extinct attractions. So it really is a combination depending on just what hits me that this week. Next week, too, you'll probably hear a couple more Star Tours or Star Wars-based ones because Star Wars Weekend is coming up. Uh, so sometimes I do try and theme them. Sometimes it's just luck of the draw or whatever seems really interesting at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Next email is from Michelle. She says, Hi, Lou. Love the show. Thought maybe you could address this question on the podcast. I was recently reading an article about the Disney Channel and read that there was a show called Epcot Magazine in the mid-80s. Apparently, it was filmed in the park. Do you know anything about the show? Michelle, actually, I do. And you bring back a great memory of a show that I used to love and, like you said, was on the Disney Channel back in the 80s. It was recorded right in Epcot Center. Uh, It was known as Your Daily Adventure into the World of Great Ideas. It was hosted by Michael Young, and you might remember him from such shows as Kids Are People Too. And he also had a special guest star that co-hosted each week. 
It was a half-hour show. It started in early 1983, ran for only about a year or so. I remember seeing stars of the late 70s and early 80s like Ruth Buzzy and Phyllis Diller, Jacqueline Zeman, Dana Hill, who was Audrey Griswold in the European Vacation movie. Uh, I distinctly remember the lady that started Jazzercise being on and more than once. Yes, I'm really old. Uh, and a lot of others. I really remember and very fondly this show and shows like Walt Disney World Inside Out when the Disney Channel had shows that came right from the theme parks. I would love to see them do something like that again. I have not really seen anywhere online that you could either find some videos from Epcot Magazine or buy them on DVD. Every now and then you might find some old Walt Disney World Inside Out that do show up on eBay that are a relatively good quality. You can tell they were transferred from VHS, but I have yet to see anything from Epcot Magazine show up online. If any listeners have a copy of it, maybe an old VHS tape or have digitized it, by all means, please let me know. I'd love to see a copy of it. And if you're interested, we could even uh, put it up online and share it in the show notes. Finally, an email from Livia Lobal from Pennsylvania, who said, first, love to say how much I enjoy the podcast. It's the absolute highlight of my week. And she loves the sound clips that I play because they take her right back to the parks. She was referring back to a question from show 65 about the radio music from the Kilimanjaro Safaris. She actually has the exact track to share for the listener. That was a song from an album by a group called African Dawn. The CD can be found on Amazon and it costs about $30, she said. The song is track number four with the title of Papa Duniani. So she wanted to make sure I let that listener and all listeners know said to keep up the great work. Olivia, thanks very much for uh, writing in and sharing that with us. And that is all the time I'm going to have for emails this week. If you have any emails that you want to send in and answered on the show, you can send them to lou at wdwradio.com. Or if you have a voicemail that you want answered, you can call that in at 206-202-4WDW. Thanks for tuning in again this week. I hope you enjoyed the show. I want to say special thanks to Walt Disney World Ambassador T.C. Newman, as well as Jeff Pepper for joining me this week. I'll have another segment leading up to Star Wars Weekend coming up next month, and I'll be there the first weekend in June to cover it some more for the show. If you want to be on the air and have a segment suggestion, comment, or question, you can email me at lou at wdwradio.com or call the voicemail directly at 206-202-4939. That's 206 202 for WDW with your comment, review, question, or just a hello from the parks. Be sure to go and visit the new WDWRadio.com for show notes, including photos and links to topics that I covered on the show. There you'll also find some recommended products and services. I want to let you know that All Star Vacation Homes has an exclusive deal going just for WDW Radio Show listeners. Now you can receive a free rental car and $50 gas card with your seven-night stay in a three- four- or five-star vacation homes. You can visit the link in the show notes to take advantage of this offer and search for your vacation home, or if you just go and visit allstarvacationhomes.com, be sure to mention code WDWTRIVIA when you make your reservation. Also, if you're heading to Walt Disney World in January 2009 during the Walt Disney World Marathon Weekend, Mouse Fan Travel has an exclusive deal, which gives you not only great rates, but free admission for two guests to a VIP Illuminations dessert and viewing party between January 8th and 12th, 2009. Your packages are going to include four nights at a select Disney resort, the VIP party, and so much more with rates starting as low as $206 per night. I will put a link up in the show notes for more information. I have lots of exciting things coming up in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. And if you are a new listener, please go back and check out some of my older shows, as most of the content really isn't time-specific, and I think you might find some topics and interviews you'll really enjoy. You can find the full list and the show archives on the site. And if you're going to be in Walt Disney World for Star Wars Weekends, the first weekend in June, I will be there as well and likely be recording from the parks. I'll put a link in the show notes to a thread over at the forums at DisneyWorldTrivia.com of people who are heading down that weekend. And if you happen to come down, see me running around the parks, maybe even if I'm waving my lightsaber frantically, disappointed that I still can't participate in the Jedi Training Academy, that's okay. Please come on over and say hello. And remember, if you want to comment on the show, please post your feedback at the forums at DisneyWorldTrivia.com. And please review the show on iTunes if you like it. But more importantly, please help spread the word and let others know about it. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week. See ya. Hello, Lou. Hey, this is Kevin Wheeler. I'm calling in from the Pop Century. 
I had uh, sent an email about college kids and all that. Uh, I'll you out. But uh, the room size is fine for, you know, for adults. I have no problem with that. The only complaint I have is the bus. But other than that, I'm having a great trip. Thanks. Bye. I got a bad feeling about this. I have a very bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. I have a really bad feeling about this. I have a bad feeling about this. You're all clear, kid. Now let's blow this thing and go home. with you always.